know what? The more you do is there less All right. Even my cousin, my uncle from Montana, and they're like, yeah, we're making some nose, and I'm like, yeah, I'm sure. stuff like that. Slow news, babe. Morning, everyone. It's 7 a.m., Wednesday, July 31st, 2019. We'll call this meeting of the Fergus Falls City Council Committee to hold to order. Roll call, please. Here. 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 Yeah. Here. We have a quorum. Uh, first item of business on the agenda this morning is a discussion item on code enforcement, and we'll call on April Zumoff. Morning, April. Good morning, Your Honor, Council members. Um, I'm coming to you just for a little bit of guidance, honestly. Um, so I want to kind of be quick, but I also want to just open your eyes. Um, I want to work with everybody, get on the same page. And I think there's some learning curves here. There's some things in our codes that don't address everything that I'm getting called about, um, people are complaining about. And there's some new things that I, <laughs> I don't think has been a norm in Fergus Falls before. Um, so I'm just going to start here. And it's, it's regarding our parking story, storage regulations here for campers, boats, trucks, um, vendor vehicles such as trailers that sell food or do the boutiques, um, buses, and then parking on the front lawn. So I'm just going to hit our code ordinance so we're all familiar with that. Um, Off-street parking and loading. Off-street parking and loading facilities shall be subject to the front yard, side yard, and rear yard regulations for the use district in which the parking is located, except that, and this is all related to residential zoning, R1, R2, R3, or R4 zone, off-street parking areas for one or two family residents shall be in the rear, side yard, garage, carport, upon a well-defined driveway, or an area not to exceed 12 feet in width, butting the driveway on one side, only in the front yard. The parking area designated in the front yard abutting the driveway shall not be less than three feet from the side lot line and shall be surfed, <laughs> surfaced with either concrete, asphalt, or gravel. And I'm just going to show you pictures. And I'm asked after this meeting that you guys kind of take a different look around town because these are the things that I'm getting called, <laughs> calls about a lot. Um, these are two vehicles on two main roads through our city that are, one is right on a sidewalk. <laughs> And the other one, or actually both of them are on sidewalks. Um, so I'm going to just start off there, that we have vehicles that are appearing on sidewalks. And, and um, that is something that they are supposed to be on their property, not to obstruct a walkway. Um, the top left corner is an older car that someone's trying to sell. It's in the front corner lot. Um, the top right corner, you can see that there's a RV. There's a truck, there's several vehicles there. Um, the lower left corner is, is again, a, a truck with a broken out back window with a piece of plywood. And the lower right one is a car that um, had a flat tire. And you can't see it very well, but again, I'm getting a lot of calls about this because these are things that have sat around town or just, just becoming more prevalent lately. Um, so I'm gonna hit on storage. <laughs> Unlawful storage. It is unlawful to park, store, or place any of the following on public or private property other than in a licensed junkyard unless housed in a lawfully erected building or enclosure or is placed behind a dwelling so not to be visible from the street or adjacent properties. So that, that is where calls are coming from. Is somebody will park something in their front yard, backyard, right in the side of <coughs> the yard, it's right out somebody's window. Um, so unlicensed vehicles, unregistered or inoperable. So that means a flat tire, it cannot move from the premise on its own. Um, hood up, those kind of things. If you can get it moving, it's operable. It needs to be licensed, registered, insured. Household furniture, furnishings, appliances, intent for outdoor use. Um, this goes with the free items that we see on the boulevard. You know, it happens usually around the big citywide uh, armor sales at the Daily Journal. Um, sponsor, or puts on and puts out the ads for 
lawn mowing maintenance or snow removal equipment and tools out of season and when not in use. You'll see lawn mowers sitting in snow banks this last winter. <laughs> um, no snow blowers on them. And right now you'll go drive around town and see snow plows and um, snow blowers sitting around in yards. Building material, construction equipment, construction tools, construction materials, or demolition material without a valid building permit issued by the city. Um, so this goes with like the skid steers, um, you'll see lawn or farm equipment in town. You'll see uh, lifts that just somebody there picked up and brought home and, and they had intention of using it someplace, but it's been sitting there for a period of time. And there's no building permit active on that property. Um, recreational tools and equipment, snowmobiles, all-terrain vehicles, other related vehicles and equipment out of season and when not in use unless properly trailered and as permitted under subpart six. So this is a question I get a lot. My neighbor has tons of snowmobiles, tons of ATVs, and a camper, a boat, and collect about four trailers and then have all these recreational vehicles too. It's legal to have these recreational vehicles as long as when they're not in use and um, staff has kind of talked about this too when it's not in season. So if it's in right now, snowmobiles should be trailered, parked in the rear one third of the lot. You're allowed two trailers per property for storage. Um, so here's an example of construction equipment um, going on on the top left hand picture the lower right one is a trailer that's for sale um, that's something else we're seeing a lot is is it's fine to sell property as long as it's on a defined driveway um, not in the right away not in the street um, and actually this is the reason i'm here today i had a lady call me and she said my daughter um, is a painter she'd like to come to fergus falls and um, she lives in bloomington She's unable to store her trailer in her front yard. Um, my neighbor has a trailer, a business trailer next to me. I'd like to bring it here and advertise for her. And then she can just store it in my front yard. And as you read through our ordinance, it doesn't really allow for them to be stored and kept there for long periods of time. If you're loading on loading is how I've always enforced the code. Um, this is a property, some of you may have gotten calls on it. <laughs> um, this is an individual that, it's a corner lot. Um, two large storage buildings. Um, and then there's a truck that's parked in the front yard with a trailer attached. A kind of truck that goes in and out of registration and then a trailer there as well. Um, and this one's a really hard one to enforce because they have a defined parking area. Um, questions I've been asked is, isn't, isn't there a limitation on how many vehicles, how many trailers can be kept? Isn't there any regulation on how much green space we have in the front yard? Um, here we go. This is the same property too. It's two different pictures. I couldn't get, I couldn't get the, the money shot of getting all three of the trailers. This is a front yard. There's a utility trailer in their driveway a pontoon, and then another utility trailer sitting in the right-of-way. <laughs> um, here we have another boat for sale that's sitting <laughs> on our sidewalk. Um, that one has, you know, many of these have moved. Um, the lower right one is one that I would say is acceptable. It's parked on a defined area. Um, it's not intruding on anything. Um, and it's, it's covered. Um, that would be not something I would get a complaint about. The one on the left, I would, I, I've gotten several complaints on those kind of situations. April, I have a question. Absolutely. House painters, if they're painting a house. As long as they have an active project going on As long on as there, they have an active project, you're not gonna say anything? They shouldn't be de um, detaching the trailer and just leaving it on the street. Um, I just had that incident here. Yeah, I just uh, got a phone call on that. Because I almost run that. into the trailer. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, trailers are supposed to be attached to a vehicle when parked on the street. They're only allowed there for 24 hours. Um, how, about if he's, how about if he's got a house that takes him a week or two to paint? That trailer should be parked elsewhere or attached to a vehicle, and they should be able to move it every 24 hours while they're doing it. 
I think there's something there that we can work on to let them leave it there while they're working on that house. And that that's the kind of things, like I said, if there's things, questions, thoughts, concepts, please let me know. I, I want to be able to enforce this code fairly consistently throughout our community. Um, this is an ATV example. Um, there's actually three ATVs there. Um, then there's a pickup and then there's a trailer parked along that little shed that's there. And um, there's a couple other issues there, but the ATVs um, are the main concern. Um, on the lower right-hand corner, there's an ATV parked on a trailer, front yard, and a right-of-way. <coughs> and then we're going to hit campers. And for some reason, we have lots of campers in our community, um, which is great. We have people that want to get out, enjoy the outdoors, um, enjoy family time. Can you close that? <laughs> so the term trailer coach, and, and our term is a little outdated, means a portable structure or vehicle so constructed and designed for the occupancy there of a dwelling or sleeping purpose. <coughs> Example, camper, camper or motor home. <coughs> Illegal parking trailers. It is unlawful to park an occupied trailer coach as follows. On any street or public place for a period of time exceeding eight hours, and then only between the hours of sunrise and sunset unless housed within a lawfully erected building, except a place or area duly authorized and where parking is permitted during nighttime hours. Um, so I would say a paved driveway, a defined driveway is legal, you're good there. Um, but what we're seeing is they're getting pulled in the front yard, in between properties. Um, so going on to subpart two, for more than 48 hours on the premise of any occupied dwelling or business lot, nor more than 24 hours on any lot, which is not part of the premise of any occupying dwelling. So I'm going to speak to this a little bit. We have people that have bought neighboring lots to them because they want a vacant lot next to them, and those lots fill up with stuff it, you know and I'd probably I would do the same thing <laughs> probably guilty too um, but it just gets to be a big collection there over time um, or business when the same is occupied except in a trailer coach park unless permitted therefore shall have first been obtained as required by the section and then parking only one occupied trailer coach in the rear of the dwelling in any district is permitted providing no living quarters shall be maintained nor business practices in the trailer while the same is sold parked or stored. So this this is the new thing that I've been dealing with is I have ran into five camper trailers that have been lived in and I've had to work with the PD um, or the or the owner or consistently kind of nag to get that individual out of the trailer and get the trailer camper moved out of there so we don't have people living in campers in a residential area right next to a house. Is it the people living in there, are they <coughs> related? I mean, they're, what's the relation between the people that are, where are they? Sometimes it is a friend of somebody that said that it was fine that they parked there and they plugged into the outside utilities. Um, other times it was people that were living there that, was, that said they were moving out. It was a rental situation. They were being evicted, but they were moving into a camp, camper trailer. It was only supposed to be there for a week or two. It turned into a month ordeal of us fighting to get it out of there. And neighbors calling and... Sure. So these are the kind of things that we're seeing. The top right is a camper trailer, you know, and this is the question of storage is allowed seasonally, you know, during this time of year. Again, I don't see an issue with it being parked up in the front driveway, so you have easy access to it. But sometimes these campers get left in the front yard and it creates some issues with the snow removal and then people getting in and out and that bump out of where snow is not being adequately moved. Um, I've had a lot of complaints of things being parked on the street and the sweeper going by and they're really upset that that vehicle or whatnot was there because they've missed the sweeper going by twice this year. So the top right is one I'd say is acceptable. It's the lower left. Um, top right during summer months, lower left is a camper, boat, riding lawnmower, and two inoperable vehicles. Um, here's another example of things just kind of collect. Um, this picture doesn't say it well, but 
this is on a corner that camper sticks out away so when the snow plow comes through and this was a camper that stayed there all winter it's on a defined driveway um, there is a pickup with a trailer or pickup with boat on and then alongside the house is a car with a utility trailer hooked up to it and then a, a jet, jet ski that's sitting along there so they're exceeding it you know and it comes and goes during the summer months but it's during the winter months when it collects up and then more stuff moves in there <coughs> and progresses um, this is a fire safety or this is a safety issue in the eyes of our building official we've talked through this I've talked with this with the um, fire inspector and fire chief um, our PD our EMT is our fire department should be able to access around the entire building um, say that fire that happened up on North Oak or was it North or South Oak? North Vine. North Vine, thank you, I was off the street. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, say if this camper was sitting in the middle, you have fuel source for a fire, and then you also have a pro two pro two fifty gallon protein tank, propane tank sitting in the front of that camper, so it would just flash over from one building to the next, creating additional hazards. Um, you know, one suggestion I had, or I would like to make on this, is that there's a setback from dwellings and property lines so that there's that access around properties. Um, now keep in mind, I know Fergus Falls is kind of unique with our, our um, lots and um, we have some hills to our properties and some yards don't have backyards, some properties only have a front yard. Um, so there are things that we need to take into consideration. <clears throat> this one was this winter. Uh, this is a camper. Um, this is as you can see, a very long camper. I was just really impressed with this guy's backing skills, so I just had to share this picture more than anything else. <laughs> um, but again, it's sitting between two houses, and you can see that it runs, and this is a 150 foot deep lot, runs from the back side of the house all the way to that garage back there. So it takes up a large space there. Um, these are some of the motor coaches, or motor coaches that we're seeing more around town this one's on a defined driveway but it's been jacked up appears to be living and I've never been able to catch anybody living there but it's been there for quite some time um, the other thing our ordinance says is anything that has a one-ton capacity should not be parked in a residential zone and these larger um, motor coaches would meet that criteria um, park on our street. Again, this is an abutting property. We have a camper on the lower left, a boat, utility trailer, a fish house, and then another dump trailer in front of there. <laughs> if you gotta see it. <laughs> but you're right. <laughs> um, you know, so this brings up a question for me is if you want me to start enforcing that these motor homes are not allowed in residential. This is an example of one that has been there. I have been in Fergus Falls for 12 years, been with the city for five, and I think the day I moved into Fergus Falls, that camper that was there. <laughs> um, it's never bothered me. It's kept, it's maintained. Um, but this is a question that there are these situations where code maybe wasn't enforced or it was So does this, this one, does this one violate the code? It's, it's over the side, the the capacity, the one time capacity. For the front yard. But it's in his driveway, right? It's in a resident mm -hmm. and it's a residential zone. I know exactly where it's at. So, <laughs> <laughs> Everybody it has nodding been, here because <laughs> And it has been there for years. <laughs> and they go they go south in the winter. In in the interest of time, yes. can we get to yeah. kind of like because it's twenty past seven oh, and, and there's a lot to go through. <laughs> so I think we get the point that okay. there's kind of issues. So what's your question? So my question is I'm just looking for some direction. How how strict does the council want me to be enforcing? Remember the code is the code and that is, is what I go by when I'm going on enforcing, working with citizens. Um, I want to point to semi-trucks and trailers because we are seeing a lot more of those pop up. They're not allowed to be left on the street in residential, but there's nothing stopping them parking up in the lot but, or up in somebody's driveway. Um, so I, like I said, I'm just, Bringing some awareness to the council. I'm sorry to take up so much time. Um, I, 
had asked for a five minute countdown, but <laughs> I should have told all of you guys to say April cut it off at five minutes. <laughs> Your Honor, if I, yeah. I think there's a lot to, to review and this is good to bring forward and bring some light to it, but I think probably more than what we're going to get accomplished this morning being our, our list. So yeah. I don't know if we could have a work session around this with with the bigger discussion between all of the issues that we're seeing and, and come back with and possibly some input from Kyle's Correct. Kyle and uh, Ryan's department as well yeah and then I, I yeah I I understand your um, desire to have a consistent code that you can just enforce I wonder if there's a way to um, you know get the public's input too because some of these I think some of these like the some of the instances you mentioned they're not bothering anyone they're technically in violation and of that's, code that's when the violations found is I get a complaint yeah. and sometimes I go there for the one complaint and I'm finding three other complaints sure. that so that maybe there's a way to get that public input too so that we can clean those up Tom did you have a comment <clears throat> yeah and I guess I, I would just maybe ask that you you know work with staff to just prepare some suggestions that you might have but if you think changes need to be made to an ordinance um, you know, I mean, I think that you, obviously the ordinances should be enforced, um, especially when there is a complaint. Um, you know, so I, yeah, if you think changes need to be made, then then let's let's see what you think and uh, and go forward. I would just ask: Have council been contacted? I'm, I on, on these kind of issues because I know I'm always sending <coughs> citizens to say talk to your council member, and I I haven't had a I haven't had a a complaint call. I've, had, I've talked to a few people that um, have corner lots, so they don't have a back back lot, and so you know they find um, challenging to try and get get in the rear one third when they don't have a backyard. But those aren't complaints; those are people that have, have been complained on, I guess you could say, and, and they've asked me like, "What do I do?" Um, but, and I think it's I think there's a lot to go over, and I think we need to not only have staff's recommendation with the chief and fire chief and police chief but i think this is a bigger issue that we need to <coughs> try review as a whole and and i think we need time. to have a work session on that whole thing the only the only call i've had is just from the painter who had mm -hmm. got a warning slip on on his trail <clears throat> the one question i have as far as the uh, tractor trailer is concerned is that ordinance imposed on the a combination or both i mean can if somebody takes his drives for a living, takes his trailer and go parks it on a lot, drives his truck home, is home for the night or for the weekend, and then gets in his truck, drives it back, because it doesn't take much more space than a full, you know, pickup truck does when it's in that condition. And then this way here, he's not having to force himself to drive his car to his truck, get in it, move it, and hook up to his trailer. You know, that, you know, I'm just kind of curious where the ordinance is on that, because I wouldn't have a problem with, you know, him dismounting his trailer somewhere, bringing his truck home, <clears throat> parking it, and then going back and hooking up. The way up. our ordinance is right now, it allows it to be parked in someone's driveway, but it does restrict the parking on the street, and we have had damage from just the tractor sitting on the street. Okay. The other issue <clears throat> that we'll get is in the wintertime, they'll leave their trucks running, or if the atmospheric pressure is just right during different times of the season, where the exhaust from the truck doesn't dissipate, just hangs in the neighborhood. So those are some of the issues that we get called on. Okay. All right. Thank you, April. We'll bring this back with the staff recommendations and have a, a round of work session and try to get the Thanks, April. consensus on the ordinance. Thank you, April. Uh, next item on the agenda is an aquatics committee update. <coughs> Call on Bridget Leonard. Good morning, Bridget. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Mayor and council members, good to be with you this morning. Um, just a brief update and then a request from you. Uh, the Aquatics Committee is still going and working. Uh, just as a review, we had a feasibility study done by US Aquatics in December of 2017. Uh, Katrina Lynn helped us with a positioning study in February of 19. Uh, and then the Aquatics Committee was represented by the, in the, at the task force, in the task force, um, which was, I think, a good process. I think that the aquatics work was seen really positively by that task force, and it was a good opportunity to share uh, kind of the work of our committee thus far. Um, we have had to look at a new location. We were going with the Kirkbride Park, 
and SHPO has said that that is not okay, uh, given the historic preservation issues, desires. So um, our ask today is that we continue our work. Uh, we re-engage with U.S. Aquatics, ask them to give us a proposal or a bid um, on what it would take to review sites and review scope and kind of redesign what the project will look like. Thanks, Bridget. Questions, comments from the staff? Do you have any idea, Bridget, um, what the scope of that engagement with U.S. Aquatics would be? I don't, uh, I mean, tell me more. I mean, do you, you're just asking the council to give you authorization to get a quote from them as far as what right. that would look like. Yes. So that, I don't I don't know cost sure. wise. So we're we're just asking to go to them and say, hey, What's it we got to kind of go back to the drawing board here. Um, there was some community feedback about the the scope of the project. Um, our committee kind of wants to work with them. Okay, if we if we move this or cut that, you know, tell us kind of how much all. So yeah, I don't know. Sure. Exact cost yet? It's just just authorizing to kind of keep go back working. And, call them back. <laughs> sure. And we are going to have an update from that project task force on Monday night. So it kind of goes in line with what you're talking about. And then I think the intent is to re-engage on the 21st. Is that right, Lynn? October, uh, August 21st, um, as a follow-up to the February task force, or uh, council retreat. So any questions of Bridget? Is there someone like to make a motion? I'll offer the motion. Thank you, Jim. I'll second. Thank you, Krista. All in favor of the motion to bring this to the council, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you, Bridget. Thanks, Thank Bridget. you, everyone. Next item on the agenda is an HRA levy request. And I'll call Michael Olson. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. <clears throat> I provided for your packets a letter sent to City Administrator Andrew Bremseth a few weeks ago. Um, this is an annual request that the HRA makes, and uh, since we have a few new members on the council, uh, it was suggested, and I think it's a good suggestion, that, that perhaps I provide a little additional information and, and uh, take the time to present the request and, and, I guess, hopefully answer any questions any council members may have about the HRA, the programs uh, that we deliver, and, and how some of the financials work to, to deliver the, that programming. Uh, both in the city of Fergus Falls and in Ottertail County. So um, if you would uh, maybe jump to the second page that uh, that was included in your attachment. Um, I broke down just very quickly here uh, kind of how our staffing looks and, and um, uh, how that staffing works with each of the individual programming areas delivered through the HRA. Uh, we have 10 staff persons uh, on board. Two of those staff people work directly with the Section 8 Rental Assistance Program um, and, and both of our part-time staff members uh, assist in the taking of applications, answering phones, uh, you know, kind of working on a day-to-day -day basis with both landlords and, and tenants that participate in that program, answering questions uh, oftentimes about <coughs> things, um, you know, like conditions and, and uh, lease approvals and, and lots of different day-to-day -day activities involved in those um, uh, rental assistance programs. Uh, housing and Urban Development provides us dollars both for the uh, rental assistance program and they provide a portion of dollars that helps with the ad administrative costs of delivering that programming. So uh, uh, our, our local tax levy uh, is really a necessity for us to continue delivering those, those programs. Uh, if you take a look budget-wise, uh, in Fergus Falls right now, the HRA is assisting 165 families with uh, rental assistance in Fergus Falls, and we assist about 115 in Ottertail County through that same programming. So we have two two separate agencies working out of the same office, two separate areas of operation, two separate sets of, of uh, programming that we work with there. Um, housing and Urban Development, unfortunately, has, has uh, cut to some degree the amount of funding that they're providing to HRAs, both for direct rental assistance and for the administration of programming. Um, Fergus Falls HRA had, not too many years ago, uh, funding for up to 185 families in the city of Fergus Falls. And Housing and Urban Development really is saying now, we've got X amount of dollars for you, assist as many folks as you can. 
Uh, the average rental assistance payment for our rental programs is about $365 a month. Tenants pay 30% of their income in, so we have tenants that are receiving rental assistance that could be as low as you know, $20 or $30 a month in assistance, all the way up to paying 100% of their rents. So in a nutshell, that's, that's uh, how we handle the rental assistance uh, with the Section 8 programming. Uh, we have public housing in Fergus Falls. We have 68 units of public housing in Fergus Falls. 60 of those units are contained at Riverview Heights. Those are all one-bedroom units um, with a, um, with a, a uh, public housing subsidy. Uh, if you look on the budget page uh, that was provided as the third page, you'll see there's an operating budget provided by HUD and a capital improvement uh, budget provided by HUD. So on an annual basis, we make an application to HUD for those dollars. Uh, operations assist us with kind of the day-to-day -day maintenance things and, and a portion of the uh, cost for staff and delivering um, services. And uh, the capital improvements fund is dedicated directly to uh, building improvements for those 60 units located at Riverview Heights uh, or for the eight scattered sites. We have four duplexes in town. Uh, we consider uh, they're called scattered site public housing units. So, so we have eight families in town that we assist. Those operating dollars and those capital fund dollars are spread between all 68 of those units in town. Uh, Timber Place Townhomes was built in 1997. That's a 20 unit uh, that was a tax credit project. Uh, MHFA was a big supporter in the, in the construction of that project. And, and um, uh, with that type of construction, we have some minimum and maximum incomes allowed for folks to get into that project. Uh, and then we also have uh, a rehab department here that, that works with Oh, uh, both residential and commercial projects in Fergus Falls. Uh, Fergus Falls is very fortunate to have our, our uh, business development uh, pool of money and uh, get out and assist businesses in town with, with uh, needed improvements for facades or, or uh, remodeling type activities. So our rehab staff works directly with, with folks on that. And um, uh, as we've talked about uh, maybe more recently in terms of rehab projects, uh, Minnesota Deed has their Small Cities Development Program grant, which we were re recently awarded for a neighborhood in Fergus Falls. Uh, that'll be Vernon to Channing and uh, Arlington to Oak. And we'll be working on that project, hopefully starting this fall yet. As soon as our environmental review is complete and approved, uh, we'll start sending out applications. So with some luck, we'll have applications out this fall, and then we will have 30 months total uh, to complete those 20 projects that we applied for there. So. Uh, our request today uh, is, is the authorization of our uh, uh, maximum tax levy request, 0 0.0185 of, uh, percent of, of estimated market value citywide, and, and those dollars are spread across all of our programming just to help cover the administrative costs that, that uh, other funds can't cover for us. Thanks, Michael. Uh, any questions? Uh, d d is that 0 0.0185, is that, cons is that consistent? That's the... That's the maximum allowed by I statute yeah. for okay. the HRA to levy. Okay, and that's what we've done in the past, correct? It is. Yeah. Any questions? I'll offer that. Thank you, Jim. Bring oh. that to the council. Second, Second that, Anna. Tom, any questions of Michael or city staff? All in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, Thank same you. sign. Motion carries. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Michael. And thanks for the work you're doing at the HRA. That's those are important services. Appreciate it. Uh, item number four, call on our city administrator, Andrew Bremseth, to give us an update on city planner services. Yeah, thank you, Your Honor. Members, good morning. Um, as you all know, I've talked about this a little bit in the past at this committee, and, and uh, hopefully it doesn't come as a surprise. But as you know, our previous city planner left us earlier this spring. And since that time, we've been busy identifying and exploring options related to filling that vacancy. Um, initially, we posted the position and went through a process related to recruitment and uh, had very few applicants, had a very tight pool from which to uh, potentially choose. And during the same time, there were other communities in the state that were looking for the same position. And in talking to them, there were other communities that didn't receive a single applicant. And these are communities that I would consider to be desirable landing spots for people in this profession. And so uh, knowing that information, it was kind of one of those um, reality checks or wake-up calls, so to speak, that uh, we may really struggle to find 
the necessary talent to fill this gap, especially in a community the size of Fergus Falls. And so we started looking at other options and uh, the human resources director and I met with two different firms, the first one being Sourcewell. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Sourcewell, I always say they're the Lakes Country Service Cooperative of the next region to the east. They're located and headquartered out of Staples, Minnesota. And they were previously known as the National Joint Powers Alliance. And I think a lot of people uh, would recognize that name when it comes to cooperative purchasing. They're a huge organization that does a lot of um, nationwide cooperative purchasing. And uh, the second organization we met with was a, a local service called Hometown Planning, and they are based out of Alexandria. They're a firm of two. So certainly two different ends of the spectrum related to the size of organiza organizations that we were visiting with. And uh, in talking to both of those organizations, both were interested in providing planning services to the city of Fergus Falls, and both were uh, kind and generous enough to give us proposals for those services. And uh, in reviewing these proposals with the personnel committee, we ultimately decided that our preferred, <coughs> excuse me, that our preferred partnership was with Sourcewell. And uh, we're making that recommendation today. Um, I guess to summarize what this could look like, uh, Sourcewell is envisioning that they have one employee in their planning and zoning department that would be split evenly between the city of Fergus Falls and the city of Little Falls, who's looking at this at the exact same time. We both would start in this program at the same time and um, would have that dedicated staff person for both of our communities. We would designate office hours, whether it be one day a week or, or a few days a week, but a minimum of one day a week in Fergus Falls and a minimum of one day a week in Little Falls. And uh, this individual would be responsible for all of the planning and zoning related activities in the city. While they're not in the office, they're always available via phone call. Um, they would be responsible for various planning and zoning reports to the planning commission and city council. They would attend those meetings or call into those meetings and represent uh, the planning commission and city council on zoning and planning related matters. And really would be doing everything that uh, full time city planner on staff would be doing um, the only drawback in my mind is, is the, the uh, limited availability or the, the lesser availability of face-to-face -face interaction with the public. But uh, knowing that we'll have dedicated office hours, we'll just have to condition ourselves to understanding when that person would be available for that face-to-face -face interaction. Um, going with Sourcewell not only provides that uh, dedicated professional that would be split only between two cities as opposed to several entities, um, Sourcewell also provides a lot of other services that I think could be beneficial for the community. For example, they do a lot of comprehensive plans. That's a priority of the city council as I understand it and something that would be forthcoming. They would be a prime fit to do that. They also have a lot of in-house services such as um, video and, and and other medium that they would provide free to the community as one of their clients. And so when we were meeting with them, they were showing us videos that they have created for other communities to market the community, which I know are, are several thousands of dollars to produce. And, and they did a really good job with that. And, and these are services that would be at our disposal because of the fact that we're a partner and, and a client to them. Um, the average or the billing rate in which they propose is $60 per hour. As you saw in the proposal, there's no minimum or maximum that's flexible and fluid all the time, and we're not committing to any um, length of agreement. So if we, if we find out in six months this isn't working or we want to start looking to hire somebody, there's no obligation for us to give them a, an advanced warning. It's, it's simply stop using the service, let them know, and, and they're totally flexible with that. So. Um, I, I do want to give a, a little shout out to Ryan Miller. He's done a great job in the interim. He's stepped up and, and helped fill that city planner role as we've been going through this exploration and trying to figure out what to do. Um, Ryan has expressed a willingness to continue to bridge the gap until we have this service in place. Um, Sourcewell has contemplated starting this service in the fall, so they have the opportunity to hire somebody to then serve some of their smaller communities that they already have and allow this individual, um, whose name is Darren, to uh, focus on Fergus Falls and Little Falls. 
The uh, reason that I'm so excited, I guess, to move in this direction is, is probably more so related to the budget implications. Not only am I confident that we'll have a, a high level of service and a very professional individual doing these services, I estimate that uh, we would use about $55,000 worth of services through SourceWell. And uh, to hire a full-time planner with salary and benefits, we would have budgeted $109,000. So I'm uh, estimating, along with the help of others, that uh, we could realize a cost savings of about $54,000 in 2020 alone by moving in this direction. And uh, I, I don't feel that we're going to lose out on, on productivity. I don't feel that we're going to lose out on the uh, professional services that we could offer through the position. The only thing, like I said, is we'll have less face-to-face -face availability. It'll have to be more structured and appointment-based rather than just show up. But I think uh, those are things we can overcome for a, a cost savings of $54,000. So with that being said, I'd be glad to answer questions. We've done a lot of work with this. I'm, I'm happy with the work we've done. I appreciate uh, Council Member Hagberg and Gustafson and their help through the Personnel Committee on this process. And um, our recommendation is to proceed in, in approving Sourcewell's proposal. Thank you, Andrew. Any questions from the council? Is there a recommendation? I'll make that, Your Honor. move that to the full council? <coughs> I'll second that, Your Honor. Sorry. Thank you, Anthony. Justin. Scott, did you have a question? Yeah, well, just a comment. I guess that although Andrew pointed it out that it'll be less face-to-face, -face, less availability as far as that goes, um, it would be something that we would need to get used to, but it's also something that the citizens would need to get used to. You know, I've had occasion to come in and get a permit, for example, for a given project. Uh, and the time was when I could walk in, talk to somebody, fill out the paperwork, and walk out with the permit. Uh, I don't see that necessarily being um, an accurate expectation any longer. Under this scenario, you may be looking at several days turnaround on just a, you know, a typical permit for an ordinary thing. Um, so. I don't know that that's unusual and probably in the course of most cities, you know, if it takes three days to get a permit for something that's just understood. Since that hasn't been the case here, it'll take a little time for people to get used to that. Um, but it's, uh, it's probably just the way it has to go, given the, the nature of the labor availability <clears throat> and, and the structure thing. So uh, reluctantly, I think this is probably a good idea. Your Honor, I, yeah, thanks, Scott. if I could, I, I agree with you completely. Um, I will say this, we still will have staff that can, you know, interact with people if they come in. So they're not meeting a, a closed door kind of thing. They may have to wait a few days for an actual permit. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some of the simpler ones, um, Ryan Miller and, and some others who are on staff will be able to do. Um, so there shouldn't be a, a terrible delay. Um, so I didn't want to make it sound like there wasn't going to be any face-to-face -face if they're not on that certain day, but, but you're right, Councilmember Kwame, it's, uh, it's not going to be as convenient as it always been, but we'll just have to, we'll have to learn to, uh, to understand how this will work. And I think, the, I think the community will be appreciative of the fact that we're looking at the cost savings that are associated with it and the fact that we'll still be able to provide a high level of service. It just won't be that instant turnaround that we talked about, but I appreciate that. Thanks, Andrew. Any other questions, comments? If not, all in favor of the motion to bring this to the council, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Um, might be a good time just real quickly to bring up, um, I had one item and it piggybacks on this, and that is the tax levy committee has been meeting for the past several weeks. And uh, in light of some of the situation, circumstances the city faces in the coming years with the closure of Hoot Lake and such, uh, we've just asked city staff to look at all operations and opportunities to, to realize efficiencies. And um, one of the uh, things that the tax levy committee has asked is that um, the uh, personnel committee consisting of council members Hagberg and Gustafson uh, look at any possible uh, efficiencies in, in city staffing. And so if, uh, but they wanted to bring it through the, the entire city council first. So um, no recommendations, just want the uh, Planning, uh, the, I'm sorry, the personnel committee to get together and just look, uh, see across the board as we look at all operations to the city, just to uh, make sure that we are being uh, stewards, of the good stewards of the taxpayer dollar. So um, if that's something that the council is okay with, we'd like to direct the personnel committee to get together and look um, across the board at the, any efficiencies that could be made. So if someone would like to... to I'll offer that, Your Honor. Would you offer that? I'll second that. Thank you. Brent, any questions? Or Justin, do you have anything to add? I'll hit. Okay. All in favor of that motion, say aye. 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 
Opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you. And, uh, okay, next, now we're, now we're up, uh, Guy. Land donation on East Lincoln Avenue. Thank you, Your Honor. We were approached by a uh, city resident, Mr. Ward Ugrud. He's offered to donate a stretch of land highlighted in purple on the map, um, approximately 253 feet, I think, in length and 75 feet in width. So it would basically extend the Lincoln Avenue right away there. Um, he's owner of the land along the river there to the east, and he's just looking to um, protect that land and to clean up some uh, right-of-way maintenance issues for us. Um, you can see the apartment uh, renters in that building there. They've used that area for perpendicular parking, and this would uh, preclude them from doing that. They would be then required to parallel park. But the uh, planning staff has determined that they do have enough on-site parking on their property with the three paved areas on their property, uh, it's sufficient parking for them. So um, just asking for a motion to accept the property donation and then to uh, authorize a city attorney to do the necessary title search and prepare the deed. Thank you, Guy. Any questions? Scott? Is this a good deal for the city? I mean, for us to take this on, whether it was in this location or anywhere, I guess when somebody wants to give you something, I, I just kind of wonder, do I really want it? <laughs> <laughs> or is it going to give me a, an issue that I have to deal with? You know? If you're wanting see... to sell it to us, then we negotiate the price and weigh it that way. I mean, when you're just going to get it and, they're, and we're not buying it, it just makes me curious. We've been doing the maintenance on the road as it is, so I don't see any issues with taking it on. Um, it it helps us out actually. Uh, we can keep the road width um, as it is in other residential areas with the parking being parallel, and so snow removal and grading of it's a gravel road grading would be easier. Okay. Thank you, guy. Any other questions, comments? I'll offer the motion to accept. Thank you, Jim. I'll second. Thank you, Krista. All in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Uh, one other additional item, as long as we have a few minutes before Andrew wants to at least start the discussion on the memorial building. And yes. Oh. Thank you, Your Honor. That's Members, I, I was hoping Annie was still here. She just walked out the door. Um, there's a developer that has expressed an, an interest again um, in the RTC memorial building and um, it sounds like a very exciting and, and, and great opportunity for that space and um, actually is, is expanded since the last time we talked to this developer and, and I'm excited about that. I guess the question I have for the City Council is, is how do you want to proceed on this? Is the property available and, and we start working with this individual or do you want to go back to the uh, RFP process and go through that process? We talked about that previously. There's an RFP draft that, that has been drafted but has been held because of the, um, the fluidity of the east and west detached situation combined with the uh, phase two and, and, and phase one last summer deconstruction. So. Um, I would like to pursue the opportunity sooner than later, and that's why I wanted to get the discussion rolling now. Um, but wondering if what the council's desires are, if they want us to go through the RFP process and uh, see all the opportunities that are out there or immediately begin working with this developer, um, who I will say was uh, on the front end, the very first developer that approached me related to the memorial building a few years back. So um, I guess that's the question I pose to city council is how do they want to proceed at this point in time? Well, can you give us an, uh, what would the RF, what would going through the RFP process entail? I mean, is it as far as time, money? Yeah. I mean, my, my point would be how many RFPs do we do? The RFP sits out there. If somebody's interested, let them, let them go for it. I mean, it's at some point, I mean, we, we do RFPs, we do RFPs. You know, somebody, if somebody has an interest, then talk to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, you know, we, it's almost like we stonewall people from wanting to do it. So, I mean, if somebody, it's out there, everybody knows it's out there. Anybody can come to the city council and say, I want to develop the RTC, and we should listen to them. And, <coughs> so, and then if we say, no, it's now, we, now we've got to make it fair. 
you know, because we want to now say, well, we're going to open it up to everybody to look, then we lose the, the first one goes away. <laughs> and, and that's what happened last time. It's it's been open for everybody yeah. since I've been on the council. Yeah. So I think So I don't think we do an RFP. I, I mean I think no. we give permission to staff to talk to them. Your Honor, <coughs> that that's what I was hoping to hear, honestly, because <laughs> I, I think this is an opportunity that we need to pursue and um, you know, I will say that the last direction of the council was to go down the RFP road. So it, yep. I just wanted to make sure that we would be comfortable going in a new direction and it would be good to to get an official action as such because the previous action of the the last city council was to go through the RFP process. I mean I don't I don't think I I mean I personally I'm not into the RFP. I think it's 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 on the website. If you if you want to put a proposal to the city, go for it. But, I mean then the more of those buildings that can get refurbished, <coughs> the better yeah. off we are. We, sh we should yeah. maybe uh, make a motion to the yeah. is that a motion to yeah, bring that to the council. Yeah. I'll second that. Second, Justin. Discussion. Jim. We've gone on with the RFP long enough. It's it's been yeah. what fifteen years. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a long time. Yeah. And I think it's time if we got somebody there that wants to do something, let them do it. Sounds sounds good. Any other questions or comments, mm -hmm. Scott? Uh, would the our, would this developer d expect uh, exclusive? Uh, control of the property while they're doing their due diligence and whatnot, as has often been the case in the past? You know, Your Honor, Councilman McCormick, I haven't had that level of discussion with them at this point in time because I wanted to figure out how we should interact and what the opportunity looks like. Um, I don't envision that this would be a long um, process that's dragged out for, for years and years. It's a pretty small building in the grand scheme of things that the development could happen in short order. So I, I, I don't know that that would be an expectation, but that's something we could ask. I mean, I, I would think that if they start to invest money in, in putting this together, they're not going to want somebody to come in and, and take it from out from under them. But, um, uh, you know, I think we wait until we, we get more clarity and then uh, see what level of commitment and, and financial uh, commitment they have to the project. I don't know how to answer that today. I haven't had enough conversation to. And I don't raise the question to try and uh, stop it from going that way. I'm just wondering how the process would work. I think that, for example, the, um, the developer that we're working with that has had interest in the east and west wings was granted that kind of exclusivity. And uh, frankly, I think that put the brakes on other possible options. And I would uh, rather see it remain available so that if another idea comes along that has got some legs, you know, let them both go for it. But I see that, you know, there's, there's trouble with that happening too. If you've got lenders who are wanting to be involved, they've got to have a knowledge that the deal is going to come together, you know. Right. But as you said, this is in the scheme of it, a smaller piece of the puzzle. And I, I would support going forward with uh, the interest that's ex been expressed. Any other <coughs> comments, questions? All, for, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Any other business to come before the council? None that I'm aware of. Just the announcements. Just the announcements. So we have uh, city council meeting on August 5th, 5.30 p.m. August uh, 7th, next Wednesday, 6 p.m. Here in the council chamber is, chambers is the uh, public information meeting on the dairy property, uh, 6 p.m., August 7th here in the council chambers. And then the next committee of the whole is August 14th, 7 a.m. right here. <coughs> There's no other business. We will be adjourned. Yeah. Yep.